where the kickback um, is, as you, I think, correctly said, it's against imposition and it's against didactic behavior and it's against um, uh, sitting in judgment. And that I think we have had enough of. And um, I think that that is where the kickback takes place. It's not in regard to the concepts necessarily. Though I've just uh, tried to say that the concepts will themselves undergo change depending on the civilizational and cultural backgrounds of the recipients, if you like. It's not a good term, but uh, of the practitioners, if you like. So um, we don't really want um, other people uh, to stand in judgment as to our own evolution. Um, if you see, I don't know whether your country is one that is favored with uh, annual reports on its, uh, you are, okay, so are we. And I think so are all, most of the developing world. Um, these reports are, um, are um, given to parliaments in the West and um, uh, they've, I, I must say, um, uh, they're valuable in some respects, but it's the mindset that I, I have some problems with. Uh, I, I was very interested uh, to see that China actually responded with a, a report of its own uh, on the U United States uh, deficiencies in governance. And um, uh, I think they still do this annually, but perhaps it doesn't have as much traction as it did before. But I think that we have been on the receiving end of much too long. This is really what I'm saying. Uh, you, uh, the Western NGOs have an enormous amount of influence in the West on, on their perceptions of uh, Asian societies. Now, um, I think that there is no Asian NGO which has anything like uh, the same, the same uh, degree of uh, traction uh, in the European Parliament or any uh, European or American Parliament. So I, I, I just feel that perhaps that um, that at least this needs to be stated, that, that, that we have our own views on various things. We are not commenting on the US elections uh, when Mr. George W. Bush was re-elected. Uh, they are commenting on ours all the time. You have uh, uh, election observation teams that come from Europe whose uh, views are regarded as sacrosanct and uh, who, whose views are debated in parliament. Where are the Asian uh, mm. observation teams in the West? I mean, perhaps we can't afford it. Perhaps we don't want to um, get involved with that. But I'm just saying that there is an inequality in world affairs that at least needs to be mentioned. It does, there's perhaps nothing we can do about it until our economy is developed to a, to a state where we can't be ignored. But the fact is that it, needs to be, it just needs to be stated. But this is not um, in terms, I'd just like to reiterate, it's not in terms of being confrontational. It's in, in terms of greater understanding. The greater understanding needs to come from the West, not from us. Thank you, I think if I'm all right, that was the point that James Mayo made in, yes, in so. his piece yes, so yesterday. So <laughs> some of us are aware of this need, even if everybody <laughs> isn't. Don't, <laughs> yes. get on, don't get on the defensive wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm just saying. <laughs> Does the red ah, light it's on now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yesterday, I thought that maybe in the title, uh, one should have added the word hypocrisy. But um, today, I think maybe uh, another word is needed, which is confusion. Because the three speakers, each one brilliant, and I really congratulate my friend Chris in uh, conceptualizing this entire uh, discussion, uh, clearly there is such a disparity of perspectives that somehow need to be thrown up, tossed around, discussed, and maybe a little bit harmonized, if that is at all possible, um, Asian values. I think it was the Japanese philosopher Nakamura who said way back in the 50s and 60s, that there is no common set of Asian values, but that there are some commonalities in Asian approaches. And maybe that is one way of looking at things. Uh, but I just throw this up as an idea. But I really want to um, 
make a somewhat different point which connects indirectly with the theme, which is that in India, we simply do not cogitate, discuss, or put out a carefully thought out perspective on foreign policy issues, be it in relation to values or be it in relation to anything else. Example, in Uganda, I think it was in June or July, Rajiv, that Prime Minister Narendra Modi came out with a 10-point plan on Africa. I think it was for the first time in years and years that any Indian Prime Minister had put forward a kind of plan on a region or on any aspect of foreign affairs. One might have thought that this would lead to a white paper because he simply put forward 10 brief points, bullet points, you could say, but nothing happened. Um, in fact, India has not produced a white paper for 40 years in uh, foreign affairs. That is to say that while we have a profusion of strategic thinkers, you know, in Delhi, if you throw a stone, chances are you'll hit two strategic thinkers, <laughs> self-proclaimed. Um, but there is no strategic thinking. We are one of the few major countries in the world that does not have a clearly written out statement of foreign policy objectives. Uh, there was an ambassador to a very important country who came to Delhi on consultations. And uh, I said, how's it going? You know, good visit. Uh, received lots and lots of instructions and ideas. He said, you know, I've been to a number of people, and they've all given me instructions. But he said, each one is different from the other. And this ambassador, truth to tell, and you know this best of all as former foreign secretary, we have never given written instructions to our ambassadors. Never. The French have a policy, a, me a method, which is called the ambassador's instructions. Every ambassador, before he takes up a post, is received by the Secretary General and receives a document of between two to five pages. I've never seen one, but this is what I'm told, which has specific instructions on what that ambassador at that point in time is to do at that particular location. This is how foreign ministries manage strategy performance. We don't have performance uh, plans in India. We simply don't. So when it comes to values in foreign policy, maybe uh, this deb debate will uh, let somebody to think that maybe we should think through our objectives, our goals, our strategy, and perhaps even our values in foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I've had it suggested to me that the, the speakers, if you could kindly identify themselves, if you'd like oh, sorry, to. Sorry, sorry. If the my speakers name is, could. My yes. name is Kishan Rana. I'm a former member of the Foreign Service. I now teach and write. I teach through the internet mainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would like to respond? I, I can take a uh, response to his point of, yes. uh, mm. about India not having a uh, strategic sense. I completely agree with you, Ambassador. Uh, if India had any strategic sense, Somnath Temple would not have been raided 17 times. I'm saying if India had any strategic sense, Somnath Temple would not have been restocked for the next raid 17 times. That, that's all I have to say. I agree with you that India doesn't have enough strategic sense. Any other comments? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if I could respond um, to your point uh, first. I mean, I, I do wonder sometimes when we judge countries' foreign policies whether we have implicitly in our minds certain standards and benchmarks. And we know there are several prominent countries out there that do have foreign policy white papers and strategic plans. But I think we also have to ask ourselves whether those are appropriate in all cases. I mean, one of in, the great strengths of India's foreign policy is precisely its flexibility. You know, going back to the point that Anne-Marie Slaughter makes about the Paris Agreement, that 
the hope that it can succeed is that it can respond to changing um, circumstances on the ground. And um, Indian foreign policy has had to contend with a great deal of uncertainty almost since its inception. The other point I'd like to make is someone who has researched um, in part the history of the uh, emergence of the Indian Foreign Service um, is that Indian diplomats, you're a very small uh, outfit compared to nations far smaller than India. Um, you have a huge workload. You have a lot of decisions to make without necessarily uh, immediately uh, seeking political clearance. And yet, you all act in relatively uniform ways. So how is that the case? So perhaps instead of a piece of paper out there in the world, we're looking at some kind of institutional acculturation, a shared worldview, perhaps a very careful sifting of who becomes a Foreign Service Officer. So instead of looking for a document, a PDF, we should be looking uh, for something else, maybe uh, an institutional mindset. Thank you. I think we might take a few questions together now, because to, there's quite a lot going around the table. Could, could I start with you, and then perhaps whoever is next after that? Looks like you've got it. Yeah. Ah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You've been very uh, generous to the previous uh, uh, participants, uh, but I fully understand that you wish to now cluster together. So I would not ask very complicated questions. I'll ask, I'll make uh, one central point, and I hope that uh, uh, panel, particularly Kate, would care to uh, answer this. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, concretize some takeaways from this uh, discussion because uh, the problem otherwise is. Uh, a kind of emerging confusion rather than clarity. So I'll put it to the panel that uh, we should make a subtle distinction between liberal values on one hand and the liberal international order on the other hand. Uh, I think we all are the children of uh, liberal values uh, sitting around this table in one way or the other. Uh, a majority of us are also colored by what may be termed as Asian values or Asian approaches. But I think none of us really has any fundamental uh, dispute with liberal uh, values as they were defined yesterday brilliantly by you yourself in terms of uh, taking a shape through reason, science, progress, peace, tolerance. Who of us would dispute that? We all are children of that and we are proud of that. In addition, many of us also take pride in our Asian heritage. So the trouble is not with liberal values, the trouble is with the liberal international order, which is liberal in name only. We saw yesterday how enlightenment eventually produced a totally unintended consequence in, in imperialism. And I'll put it to you, Kate, that while colonialism and imperialism have died a long time back, the spirit is still continues. The spirit is still lingers on. So from this, I would say that the world of 21st century needs uh, a multipolar order rather than the liberal order. A multipolar, egalitarian, inclusive, and truly democratic order. That is what we need. Uh, and I really wonder uh, whether uh, you would agree to this or you would like to disagree with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there somebody next door who would like to ask anything or shall we take that one on its own? Do I see another question down here? No, I'm not. No. Uh, well, let's, let's take that one on its own. Then. It's very interesting. Thank you. I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Um, I think the confusion arises, though, not um, in the inherent uh, guidance and guidelines of, of what a good life means that are implicit in liberal values. The problem lies with the ways in which values are used to legitimize structures of power. And so 
the international liberal order and the resistance that I've sort of picked up in our debates over the last two days is problematic because it has legitimized the forcing of modes of governance and you know, forms of, of economic exchange um, onto, from one party onto another. But I don't think that we can stop at the level of the state. I think everywhere values, whether you reject Western values or whether you embrace or redefine them or combine them with ideas from elsewhere, if you're using values to legitimize structures of power, then that's problematic. So uh, it, it's, it's the idea of whose interests are we actually championing with our values and are they really as inclusive as, as they purport to be? Um, so I, I would encourage us, I know it's not fashionable to talk about class. Um, if you talk about class, you're expected to go and address you know, an audience at the JNU. Um, but we need to talk about class because that's what the root of, of big problems are currently in the United States and in, in the UK. We need to talk about gender. Um, and we need to talk about race because I think it's implicit in everything that we're discussing when we are talking about resisting Western imperialism that continues today. Um, and perhaps we need to talk about those things explicitly. So um, whose interests and how are values being used to maintain those interests. I think that's where I would locate any project, political project that comes out of our discussions. Thank you. Do, do Chris or Ravi want to come in on this one? Um, not particularly, but I'd just like to say that people who have uh, leveraged the liberal international order and gained and prospered by it also have an obligation to play by its rules uh, when it doesn't always suit them. Thank you. Fine. Well, perhaps I'll start round this side of the table. Where were the questions? There were some hands over here, I know. Um, yes, the gentleman. Yes, thank you. I think I, I asked a basic question. Can we give labels to values when there is lot of diversity across the regions, across the countries, across the thought processes. In fact, there's a lot of blurring of values in different regions, different areas. Can we call, call this? And secondly, can, can, can values be labeled as sugar-coated pills to serve one's interests? values as sugar-coated pills to uh, serve self-interest. I think a lot of my, of what I said uh, essentially focused on that, uh, Ambassador. Uh, the selective application of uh, values uh, for, uh, and the improvisation that I spoke about is essentially talks to your point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, like uh, it was mentioned, uh, uh, I myself am a product of uh, sort of a liberal values in many ways, but uh, having spent 10 years in my, uh, of my life in the United States as a, being a graduate student, one thing I realized was that uh, liberalism is uh, sort of a, uh, has universal appeal because it kind of uh, uh, appeals to the uh, concept of uh, freedom of individuals. But Liberalism, I realized, is based on a kind of social ontology that prioritizes uh, individuals rather uh, over the sort of community, and uh, uh, and therefore liberalism does not uh, give uh, sort of full uh, credence to the claims of communities <coughs> that are not based on voluntary sort of individual agreement. Liberalism has a tendency to sort of reduce all kinds of social groupings to voluntary uh, sort of uh, uh, associations and those uh, groupings that cannot be sort of reduced to voluntary associations are often criticized as a sort of locus of domination and the hierarchy, etc. So, uh, you know, like I appreciated uh, uh, Kate uh, uh, Sullivan's uh, sort of comment on sort of uh, the problem of liberal international order is not with the liberal values, but 
the way liberal values are sort of uh, used to justify structures of power. I very much appreciate that point, but I think that the nature of the disagreement between the liber Western liberals and some proponents of Asian values go deeper than just the sort of, uh, you know, like uh, illiberal use of liberal values. Thank you. That point speaks for itself. Thank yes, you. Um, now, I think. I think it was. Sorry. Wong. Yes, Mr. Wong. No, no, Mr. Wong. Wong Chengwei. Yes. No, Mr. Wong. Not just that. No. I think the. Discussion is, uh, in some feelings, uh, uh, discriminatory. Okay, you have your liberal order, and then do you Asians? Do you have uh, Asians or the West or the West or the rest? Uh, it's Dick Turner uh, because the Asian name given by the West. So how can we have our own value? You know, there is no single or common uh, Asian values. But domestically, we have Asian countries. They have their domestic values. But our values is more uh, inward looking, not expansion, not promote, because we don't have some you know, colonial experience. And uh, so that, that, that's, uh, and also the, most of the Asian people steal agriculture, uh, for, yeah, you know, the farmers, man. So when we live in the global uh, industrial civilization uh, of the uh, civilizations, Asians, people, they're silenced majority. It seems like they don't have values, but of course they have. So that, that's kind of, uh, today, I, I think the so-called international liberal order, there are three bases. Uh, the so-called liberal, at the beginning, is from the uh, religious revolution. Jesus, uh, Christ, uh, and put the Caesar under the Caesar and the, uh, uh, the God as a God. But this, because you have the uh, Middle East, uh, uh, long uh, thousand years, but this is not happening in Asia and other places. So this liberal order, we don't have this concept, okay, liberal, what uh, liberal, okay? Uh, and then after the uh, Second World War, the liberal order is more based on the United Nations, actually. This is the only thing we agree. So there's no liberal order or the international liberal order. The only order is UN-centric order. That's the consensus. <laughs> Yesterday we mentioned about the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which China, I think most of the Asian countries endorse, right? But now you never mention that again, and then put aside this, and then talk about the liberal order. At the same time, there are two other liberal orders besides the United Nations. One is half spoken system. Put Japan as the liberal order. Even Japan, actually, the culture is more Asian. But politically, you consider about it's a West. Because the half spoken system, the US provided the uh, nuclear uh, security umbrella for them, and then the access uh, the market. So this is the kind of the uh, division of labor. And then the European Union. This is called a Christianity uh, liberal order. NATO, EU, whatever. Uh, actually, those two kinds of the order is because they cannot provide the uh, the guarantee their security. Their destiny is not in their hands. That's the Chancellor Merkel also says that the Europeans' destiny should be our hands, not just rely on the U.S. Or Internet. You don't have the single. You, you don't have the search in India. You don't have the independent uh, internet or even uh, uh, industry or the policy. So, so-called in, in, international liberal order is U.S. order. Okay, it's, it's, they provide uh, everything for you, security and the values for you. So you don't have your values. You only have your interests, but without value, as the McLeod said. So that, that's the case. When China and the other Asian countries say, we are, not, we are very independent, India as well. So when you think about the international liberal order, India is not. India say we are biggest democracy, but India for a long time was independent, non-aligned foreign policy. India is not the West. Even democracy is not mean the West. So India want to join uh, United Nations Security Council. U.S. not support. So that's problem and paradox. Thank you for your contribution. Now, we are running out of time, so I think there are two or three more questions, and I'll try and take them together. Did you have a question, uh, Zina? I did have a question, um, simply because I wanted to <laughs> swim up to the top. Uh, so much information and so much discussion about liberalism and, uh, and otherwise, but I was really just wanting to speak a little bit more about authoritarianism. You know, I find that that is 
what it seems to be a basic value here in Asia is that they're more concerned with order and discipline rather than freedom, which I think is not quite understood within the Asian context. And I just wanted to say that as far as economic growth is concerned, and it, oh, some of the panel members would address this, um, authoritarianism seems to work. I mean, you can see it in China, and the Chinese gentleman has just talked about his own uh, set of values rather than liberal as in the sense of Western sense. Um, it seems to work in China, in South Korea. Would somebody like to speak about this, please? Thank you. Uh, and then where was the next one down this side? Um, James, and then finally the lady down the end there. So uh, we'll take James and uh, your, the lady down the end and then um, we'll wrap up. Yes, James. Very quickly, I'd like somebody to say what they mean by a democratic order. Because we, I mean, Krishnan and I would agree with him on here, says that in Asia, generally, there is much more attention paid to Article 2 of the Charter. Uh, Dewey uh, then said that she didn't want to return to a world of relativism. So we have to, I think, uh, if you look at the agenda for peace, which I suggested yesterday was the sort of high watermark of liberal internationalism after the Cold War, it's got that famous paragraph in it in which Boutros Boutroskali says uh, that what we must have, and he's trying to head off secession at the past, and he says we must have democracy at every level, at the local level, at the national level, and the, the international level. Now, what does he actually mean by the international level? And what does Kate mean by the international level? And in the end, if there is a, I mean, the responsibility to protect came up briefly yesterday. Uh, it was a highly contentious principle. It nearly didn't get through. I mean, India didn't really want to put it through, but it did get through in the end. And it, I would agree with Krishna, it probably won't for reasons to do with Libya uh, be used again in a, in a hurry. But are we prepared to say that uh, no human horror justifies uh, enforcement under Chapter 7? And that, or are we prepared to say that any kind of international order it's, you, you should have a rule of thumb, which is non-intervention, but there must be occasions when uh, it intervene. Now, I think we made a huge mistake in the 1990s in the sense that there was great enthusiasm for all those UN peacekeeping operations in which the Indians, the Bangladeshis, the Pakistanis, and the Chinese became major participants. Um, but, of course... What everyone was looking for was a chapter six and a half, which doesn't exist. Um, and, and so one is left, I mean, liberals, whether they want to be uh, non-relativist liberals or if they want to retreat to the UN Charter and take it seriously, have to face up to the question of are there any occasions which are so horrific that they're going to waive their own rules. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I'm sorry, did I miss you out? Have you got a quick one? No. Uh, it, uh, could I get the lady at the end? The lady at the end, um, you had a question. No, no, you, you had a question. Sorry? Kieran, yes. Thank you. Kira Hoyu from the University of Oxford. Um, I wanted to ask uh, both Kate and Ambassador Srinivasan on the question of universality. I tried to pose this question on the liberal international order to John Eikenberry himself last year, and he refused to answer, so I'm going to try again. Um, it seems to me that we get two things conflated which seem similar but actually have entirely opposite policy outcomes, which is when we talk about the hypocrisy of the liberal international order and the fact that it isn't quite as universal, quite as international, quite as liberal or as values-based as we say, it seems that we are first saying 
there was a standard of civilization imposed on the way that international order was constructed. Hence, there was a bifurcated order where liberal values only applied to certain races and certain parts of the world. And the problem is that they should have been applied more universally. At the same time, it seems in the conversation that we're also saying they shouldn't be applied in Asia because Asia is different, and hence they should be applied yes, less universally. And so the conversation about hypocrisy seems to be suggesting two things that I think we're getting conflated a little. And so my question to the panel would be, is the qu question of universality and its limits and the hypocrisy around it supposed to mean that the policy outcome is we should be better at not being hypocritical and applying these values equally across the globe? Or is it to say we shouldn't be applying them at all? Which one is it? Because those two seem to be in contradiction with each other. Thank you. Now, I'll ask each member of the panel to wrap up on the basis of, um, of, of these final comments. Uh, uh, Ravi, would you like to start off? I'll say confer. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just make this point that values are not a fixed thing and they keep moving with time. European values have changed in the last century. American values are changing in front of our eyes. And Asians are also changing in so many ways. And, and that's what I said uh, as my last uh, sentence in my presentation, uh, that, which was that fraternity is easier when the identity and circumstances of the individual is respected. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I have you and then Chris can say a final word as you prop up? Okay. Um, if I answer James's question first, I mean, I think, first of all, Tadashi's point is fantastic, and I think we need to think about this a lot more. Um, and I really liked uh, Mr. Wong's um, uh, point about using these categories of Western and non-Western um, and Asian uh, are in themselves problematic. Um, I don't have a better alternative, but I'm as guilty as, as, as everyone else uh, in, in using those terms. Um, I think to, to combine a few of the points though, uh, especially coming to this question of RTP, um, I think the issue is that we have different conceptions of what the international liberal order is. There's a very thin conception where you have individual states that have sovereignty within their borders. This is the Westphalian model sticking to the charter strictly. Um, and that manages diversity in a particular way. Uh, each, each state uh, permitted to enact governance within its borders as it sees fit. Um, and I think most states have no problem in, in subscribing to that because it uh, guarantees their existence as sovereign independent territories. And then we have a thick description of the international liberal order where um, the individual becomes a subject of international law um, and can be protected uh, even if it requires the violation of state sovereignty. Um, and I don't think that we uh, can or should make a choice between those two because it fundamentally depends on the circumstances. Um, I think the issue is that every uh, episode of human rights abuses on a mass scale that would uh, require any kind of intervention needs to be debated very carefully, but it also needs to be debated widely. And that's the problem, that intervention decisions are made by a very narrow number of states, some of whom have more decision-making power than others. So what does democratization mean at the international level? Well, democratization at the international level means more inclusiveness, perhaps even going so far as, you know, I think the Mexican position is that we should drop the veto because that would mean no country should be allowed to have the veto in the Security Council, because that would mean true democracy. Um, whether it's more representation on the Security Council, uh, whether it's the right for um, troop contributing countries to have a greater say in peacekeeping and peace enforcement missions, I'm not sure. But certainly the way in which decisions are made at the moment uh, does not seem as inclusive as it could be. To come to Kira's question, I mean, you've provoked me to try to succeed where John Eikenbury has failed. How can I resist that? Um, I, I think the issue is that societies should be permitted to determine their own values in the most participatory and representative way that they can. Um, whether those values are universal, 
I think, cannot be decided in advance. There has to be a process. Um, but how fair that process is and how inclusive it truly is, I think, is very difficult to obtain. But you're right, there's a, there's a huge um, uh, contradiction and paradox in what we're proposing. Um, and I think probably we just need to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. And Chris, could I leave the yeah. final word to you? Uh, well, I, my final word is a question, actually. I, I, I'll ask, I'd like to ask Peter to enlighten us, because I think uh, American ambassadors, if I remember rightly, do get instructions. Uh, uh, Christian is here, yeah. I think they, he, they do get instructions, not least from the Senate uh, that uh, interviews them. Uh, and um, I would be very interested to know to what extent those instructions are, 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 are followable or followed. So if you could help us with that, I'd be happy then to have the last word. Uh, well, you're quite right, Chris, that uh, U.S. ambassadors get written instructions uh, from the State Department when they're going out, which have been at least coordinated in the White House, uh, usually not initiated in the White House, but sometimes that's the case. And also, uh, during contentious uh, Senate uh, confirmation hearings of ambassadors, uh, sometimes <clears throat> uh, an ambassador designate will be asked to commit to the Senate, not the White House, not the State Department, but to the Senate, that uh, he or she will pursue certain goals and objectives, especially if the Senate view is that the current uh, administration under, um, understates the importance of some issues. So this tends to uh, boil down to uh, politically important uh, either domestic issues or international issues relating to human rights, or in the U.S. case, relating to Israel sometimes, where uh, the politics of the matter uh, in the Senate will, uh, will trump perhaps what uh, the instructions are with regard to uh, foreign policy goals in, in general. Now, as to whether they're applied, uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, ambassadors have to make the judgment on the, on the basis of what they find wherever they're assigned and what the responsiveness is of the um, of the government to which they're uh, accredited. Uh, but in general, yes, they, they are at least expected to press on these issues, whether from the State Department or from the Senate, if, if they have them from the Senate. And uh, every once in a while, an ambassador is called back to the Senate to report on successes or otherwise. Uh, but that's unusual. That's very unusual, actually. Thank you. Chris. I wonder whether Kishan has, uh, uh, you know, got something out of that reply. Yes and no, I think, was the answer. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Peter. But I'd just like to say here um, to the lady there who spoke about universality, I think this is a problem. I think, um, again, I, I'm not at all sure that this term universality in international politics really is a very old one. I think it's a relatively new um, coinage, and I think that that also... Um, is very much a Western formulation, um, universal declaration of human rights, a Western type com uh, uh, um, uh, formulation, which I, I don't think um, it's a common currency in Asia, uh, to use universality as a term for, for describing any kind of political phenomenon. So I think we've got this difficulty. Um, in, in, I might say, must say here that um, uh, as a counterpoint to the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, um, I think, Kate, yesterday you spoke about obligations. Perhaps, perhaps I'm getting that wrong. Perhaps it wasn't you. But, oh, it was you, Veronica, yes. Now, uh, you know, the, um, a group of countries, uh, mainly from the developing world, tried to, um, uh, to bring out a Universal Declaration of Human, of, of, of human Obligations. Yes. And there is that, you will find it on the on the internet, the, it was uh, the result of uh, a series of conferences, um, and um, it was promulgated. But of course, I don't think, I'm not surprised you haven't heard of it, because none of us probably have. 
And I only came across it recently, and of course it had no traction whatsoever. It just disappeared into space. But the idea was to balance the rights question with the obligations question, and I think it was a really quite a, quite a worthwhile effort, but it, it didn't um, get anywhere. So the whole idea of global phenomenon, uh, universal uh, principles, universal values, I think this is not a nation um, concept. But when we're speaking about Asia, the um, basic uh, document I think we have to go to as far as Asian values are concerned is uh, the Bangkok Declaration of 93. Now, um, the Bangkok Declaration, uh, it was correctly said yesterday uh, that it was mainly a, uh, a, a, an initiative of Malaysia and, uh, and uh, China, Singapore, but uh, it, was, uh, it was drafted and finalized in, in uh, Bangkok. And all Asian countries were there, um, except uh, uh, except, I think, Turkey. And um, uh, this, this document, interesting document, does not mention Asian values. It also does not mention democracy. But uh, it's an interesting phenomenon because that is what really sparked the whole interest in this question of quote unquote Asian values. As the Asians, and, and I might add here that a very similar document was put out by the African group at the United Nations altogether, altogether, uh, as well. And there's very little difference between the so-called Asian Values Declaration and the African <coughs> Values Declaration. So it's not just an Asian phenomenon. And um, I'd like to say, though, that um, uh, as the Asian countries became more um, economically strong, and as their governments became perhaps more confident as a result of that, the whole idea of Asian values, the whole term Asian values, ceases, ceases to have any great uh, um, coinage. With the result that at the, at the moment, very few countries indeed, or any few uh, political circles speak of Asian values at all. So this, uh, this uh, um, idea of a contrast between universal liberal values and Asian values is actually a dead debate. It no longer, it no longer continues to be in currency. But it's a useful thing to discuss because the, the, the concept, if not the coinage, keeps coming up from time to time. So um, that's really all I'd like to say. I think it was a very interesting discussion. And um, thank you very much for your participation in it. And um, I think that it leaves uh, Ravi a little bit unhappy. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that being so... Would I, I be unhappy? No unhappiness. Let yeah. us all give our three speakers a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's coffee. I'm a bit late. Oh, well. We would now uh, break for uh, tea and coffee and uh, resume with uh, the next session at 11.30. Thank you. Um.